Welcome back to my channel. Today is part three of making my holiday bell dress. Today I'm going to show you how I made the bow that goes on the back of the dress as well as um, making her bodice and um, yeah that's what we're doing today. Uh, I can't believe we're here. Um, it's kind of crazy. It's been, it's been a long three weeks, um, but we did it. Well, you'll see at the end of this video that we did it. Um, yeah, so I guess let's jump right into making this, um, as I will link below as well as in the cards, the most previous videos, uh, well, and down below you'll get to see the whole set of videos on making bell and then in the corner I'll do the most like the last one just in case you missed that one um, and then I also link below all of the materials I used I try very hard to um, get the exact thing that I purchased but sometimes they're sold out so I do apologize for that or like I just pull something from my stash but either way I will link below the materials I used and I think that is everything. Let's get right into how I made Holiday Bell Part 3. Starting with the bow, I was originally going to make this out of the fabric that I used for the underskirt of Bell, but when I started looking closely at my references, I made the decision to try something different since I didn't have enough fabric. So I chose to use my ivory cotton and flatline it with my organza. This created a very shiny yet structured bow. I will have a cosplay template available on my website to help aid in the making of this costume, so I won't bore you with all the math and details like that. But I basically cut out two rectangles for the top of the bow, a total of four rectangular pieces for the parts that hang off of the bow, and then a rectangle for the center of the bow. I cut the same pieces out on organza, and to flatline them, I just pinned the organza on top of the cotton all around the edge, and then I went ahead and stitched it down with a basting stitch on my sewing machine. To help create a structure for the bow so it would stand up on its own, I used a material called Power Boost Lining. It's basically a fusible interlining that gives fabric strength. I adhered it to the bow rectangle pieces as well as the piece that wraps around the bow to give them all structure. Once my pieces are flat lined, I will pin them together with the right sides together, leaving a five to seven inch gap on one side in order to flip the pieces uh, right side out. Now that my pieces are sewn and flipped, I give them a rather good pressing. I want those corners to look crisp. Then I will pin the gap closed and whip stitch it closed by hand. I opted out of top stitching this down because I just didn't think it would look great on the dress and if I didn't top if I top stitch the middle without the ends that wouldn't look good. There was just too many things that I thought would not look good, so I hand stitched it down. Now, taking the bow piece that I added power boost lining to, I will be pleating down the center of the bow to create the bow shape. Then I will hand stitch the section together on both the front and back of this folded piece. I also folded and wrapped the center piece of the bow around this and hand stitched it down in the back. Then for the dangly pieces that go behind this, I gathered them down by hand and I hand stitched them again to the back of this bow area. This created a nice space for me to be able to add snaps um, so that I could attach this bow to the skirts. Okay, so here is our completed, well, almost completed bow. Um, basically, what is going to happen next is um, when I'm done with the bodice, I'm going to pin this onto the back of the, um, on the back of the, the dress 
and place a snap here, a snap here, obviously on the back side, and then figure out how many snaps I wanna place on the bow. And then also figure out if I wanna put any down on these or if they lay the way I want them to, then it's NBD. Spoiler alert, I did not end up adding any extra snaps except the two in the center piece because it actually didn't need them. All right, now let's move on to the bodice where I am cutting out my lining layer first. So I'm cutting out the front piece in this ivory cotton and then I will cut out all the side pieces in a more like a, a maroon colored cotton, again, to match the bodice. So because velvet needs a specific kind of pressing mat to be able to press it, I decided to add the fusible interfacing and boning to my lining instead of my main fabric. I think I should have attempted to add interfacing to my center front piece because it rolled up pretty bad once I was done, but I didn't think about that before. So I used Dreamweave Ultra for the interfacing and it made a really beautifully structured lining, but the lining still didn't, it wasn't really structured enough to stop some of the things I didn't like about the bodice. I stitched the dart into the side front panels first, and then I stitched all the panels together at a 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. I went back to these seams after that and stitched about an eighth of an inch away from the edge of the seam so I could create the boning channels. All right, so I can't remember if I explained this when I um, talked a little bit about velvet for the bell uh, skirt portion of this. So I'm gonna talk for a second about what's called the nap. Um, basically what that means is when you feel your fabric this way versus that way, they should feel a little bit different. Some of them also have um, a color shift when you do that. And that denotes the nap. So you can go against the nap and that will be rougher or you can go with the nap and that will be um, softer. This is a micro velvet, so they feel almost identical. The only way I can tell is by lightly touching, cause like you have to really be able to feel, like <laughs> tap into the sensories on your fingers. So we're going towards the nap, but that means that um, you have to, cut every piece out individually. Um, and I'm trying to pin basically uh, outside of the half inch mark. It's a little difficult, but I'm trying um, because we're gonna, we don't want the, the uh, pins to create holes where you will see uh, the fabric. So that's what we're doing here. And I'm basically cutting each and every piece out twice individually. And then um, once I've cut them all out, I will start from the beat, like the center and work my way out to hand baste them together. And then I will sew them by machine. And I'll reiterate all of the things that we discussed um, for those steps when I get to them. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Uh, you can, uh, in, in Professor Pincushion's video on working with velvet, she has you cut it from the back um, and you draw like a chalk line. I don't know why I am doing it this way. I just am. This is just easier for me to, to see the fabric from slipping and whatnot. So that's kind of the choice that I have made for this. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. And, uh, we're just going to pin this and then I will cut it out. They're, these are two of the pieces and then I'll cut them out again. And then I still have the sleeve after this to cut out. So I'll have these two, cut them out a second time, and then the sleeve, I'm not gonna show you all of that because well, I don't know that that's necessary. So I decided to start with my dart and the side front pieces, just like I did on my lining. I had issues marking in the back of the fabric, so I just hand basted the line for the dart with the ivory thread, since the thread color that matches my fabric is in the machine. Um, I based the markings and the fold, and then I or, and then I will fold and actually put the basting stitch to baste the dart together 
after I have stitched this lovely basting stitch. Um, and then also, like I did with the skirt panels, I will stitch this with a looser tension on my sewing machine. I don't own a walking foot, so I did have some issues sewing the velvet and it with it shifting just a bit. Um, I'll say that later on, which I didn't get footage of, when I, put, when I sewed the velvet to the lining, I had major slipping issues and where you can't really tell in the photos I took, uh, it's, it's a huge mess and it's something that I'm going to have to take out if I wear this to a convention and redo and I will probably have to redo the bodice panels as well because it's, it's just a little messy. Um, I will be purchasing a walking foot. So um, I didn't realize they were $50. Uh, so I'm waiting until that sweet, sweet Patreon payout on January 6th. But I will be purchasing one because this was like one of those things where I've been talking about getting a walking foot and I just haven't. And this was kind of the like, what was it? Like the feather that broke the camel's back. It just, you know, it. I need to buy one. So I will be doing that in the in the new year. All right, so just to reiterate what I mentioned in the last video, um, I am, I've pinned here pretty close to the edge. I uh, know I'm gonna do a 5 eighths of an inch seam here. And then now I'm gonna um, hand baste all the way up. And I'm gonna try to do a like long stitch on one side of the, the fabric and then a shorter stitch on the top. And, um, basically just do that for every single seam everywhere this connects and then I will take it open to my machine and machine stitch machine stitch it with an an 80 12 universal needle and then also at the tension of 6.5 on my sewing machine so a little bit looser tension um, and I'm still doing it at a 2.5 millimeter stitch length All right, so I did not get around to showing you guys a lot of steps and I apologize. I'm gonna try to show you as much that I did as possible. Um, so I definitely uh, whip stitched these down. This is the back of my um, dress and dress my bodice. And basically I followed the exact same process of basting and sewing to get the lining, you see the lining here, to the velvet. To sew the trim down, I basically pinned it all, and then I went and did um, a set of stitches along the along the bottom, and then I came around and pulled it around the top so that there would be um, like a top connection and a bottom connection. And some of these beads are just a little loose because I accidentally got them snagged or pulled or something, and that's kind of my bad for not being more delicate, I was I was sewing really fast. For the sleeves, so I discovered something and I thought, I suspected I did this, but like seeing that I did it was pretty frustrating. So first of all, these are the, these are leftover from trying to machine sew this down. I didn't machine sew it down. What I ended up doing was, first of all, the velvet sleeve is an inch longer than the bottom not intentionally that was a complete accident i tried to do the best i can to line them up but they do have a little bit of baggage like right here i don't hate it it's it's not gonna like kill me you know um but what i had to do basically was sew my flounce onto the velvet by hand and you can almost you can see my stitches here but that was a complete like that's not really meant to be seen but yolo um and then I folded the cotton in, folded the velvet in, pinned it with the flounces inside, making sure my bra edge was, you know, secure. And then I put this on top 
and repinned it so I basically had double the amounts of pins in and then I took the inside pins out once this was pinned. So like I used pin, so then I tacked it all down just with these stitches you see here. To me this is messy and I'm gonna say this because um, like technically I should have figured out a way to put this trim on on the sleeve before sewing down this so that all I had to do is do a quick stitch in here, something very like, um, not invisible, but something not quite as visible um, and cleaner. But you know what, this was, this was the choice I made because I just was running out of time. Uh, um, and then also um, when I sewed this velvet down, I still have to do this, I wanted to do it on camera. I left a gap big enough for my piece of boning. So we're gonna put a piece of boning in here to help um, support the grommets. All right, so that is basically everything for Belle. Um, at this point in the video, you have seen the whole construction and you've seen me wear it. Um, I had a lot, like I like this dress a lot. I love it actually. Um, and I had a lot of fun making it for the most part. Um, it was pretty stressful. I uh, went into this thinking certain things would just happen faster than they did. And that is completely my fault. Uh, I did not realize that working with velvet uh, was as difficult as it is. I also didn't realize um, like early on exactly fully what I wanted to do or how I wanted to make this uh, happen. And then I had some scheduling stuff happen that I kind of forgot about. But I did it, it happened, uh, the dress happened, I really love it, I'll be wearing it to C22 next year if C22 in December actually happens. Um, I also will probably just have it for Christmases to come. Um, there's never really a reason not to have a Christmas costume. <laughs> um, and I really love this this dress and uh, the process of making it. Um, I'm really glad I, I learned like like how to use velvet. So uh, I really like this project, and this was a great way to end the the new year, the new year, end the year. Uh, if you do like Disney costumes, historical costuming, sewing, or just pretty garments, gowns, things, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, give this video a thumbs up. It really does help my channel uh, grow. It gives the algorithm a little bit of a, n hey, like a nudge, like show this girl. She's crazy. She made a ball gown in three weeks. I know people have done harder things, I guess. Um, <laughs> anyway, so thank you guys seriously for a really great year. And uh, this is the last video of 2020. And I have huge plans for 2021, so stay tuned for that. And I hope you all had a good Christmas and a happy new year, and I will see you next year. Happy sewing! Oh.